like to pause for a moment and remember who we're thinking about today, and that's Sydney Marie Snyder. This is a Sydney Marie Snyder endowed lectureship, and if I may, I want to read a vignette about her. She was seven years old, had ALL. In September of 2007, she came to Children's National to be treated with an experimental drug. Her treatment at Children's was among her last options for treatment. Before coming to us, she had multiple relapses and all the treatments, including a bone marrow transplant, and they had all failed. While she was at Children's on the study protocol, a medication dosage error occurred. As a direct result of that error, she had to come off the experimental protocol. She subsequently died of her illness, leaving a grieving family and a distraught team of Children's. The mother's a teacher, the father's a firefighter, they're of modest means, and uh, through the risk and the discussions we had, their settlement, they gave it all back to the hospital. And they said, we want you to reinvest back in the hospital, back in your programs. That was 2007, where we started our safety journey. So we want to take a moment today to think about Sydney Marie Snyder and ask ourselves, what would we do differently today? Have we put in place different processes just as a family had wished for us? So we'll think about Sydney just for a moment. On that note, it gives us great pleasure to introduce Steve Kreiser. Um, I don't get intimidated a lot, but he's an intimidating guy. And let me tell you why, because when I'm done telling you about him, we're all going to want to be his co-pilot. So he is uh, from Press Ganey and HPI. He has over 30 years of safety, reliability experience. Really, that comes from doing what he did. Prior to joining HPI and Press Ganey, he was an officer, an FA-18 pilot, retiring as a naval commander in 2008. During his naval career, he had 3,500 flight hours, 720 carrier landings, including combat missions in Iraq, Bosnia, and Afghanistan, and we thank you for that service, and we're blessed to have you do that. He's held numerous positions in proven science and reliability, looking at root cause analyses and accident investigations. We had a really, uh, I think, fascinating discussion on the recent Ethiopian air crash, and we'll see if he has time to go into that because we see the perspective that they bring to the table. He has an MBA and a degree from the UVA in aerospace engineer. Really thrilled to have him speak to us today on a sophisticated level about high reliability. There's a lot of back and forth between Steve and our teams, and we actually wanted to push this grand round to a bit of a more erudite level. So we're, we're going to go a little bit deeper in reliability principles, and he's going to bring his experiences in. Thanks so much for spending the morning with us. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, it really is wonderful to be here. I was. Uh, uh, um, just uh, sort of hearkening back to my experience with uh, HPI and Press Gain, and I was in this room back in 2008, which uh, you know seems uh, so long ago, but it was when I was, had first started after retiring from the Navy in 2008 um, after a 21-year career, and, and um, it really was fantastic to have been there and done that, but now for almost 11 years working in healthcare, trying to bring some of those uh, ideas and principles around safety and reliability into the healthcare industry has, has been um, one of the great rewards of my life. So um, let's get started, and uh, I'll go into this topic of high reliability, focusing on some of the principles um, in the first part, but in the second part, really expounding upon, on really the practices, things that you hopefully are aware are already going on here at Children's National, and maybe some things um, that you're not, because it really comes down to our actions, actions as leaders, actions as medical staff, actions as our frontline staff. Um, I know you're probably wondering how you go from flying jets and landing on aircraft carriers to talking in uh, front of a group of healthcare professionals, and I think you used the word erudite, and remember I'm a pilot, so basic uh, kind of man, okay. <laughs> but um, it really uh, goes back to my wife, Jennifer, who's a nurse by background, critical care. Um, that should tell you everything you need to know um, and how I got into healthcare. When I retired in 2008, I was looking to do something a little different. Um, Jennifer works down at Centera, uh, one of the Centera hospitals, as a chief nursing officer. At the time, she was the director of nursing at one of their hospitals, and she said, hey, you ought to talk to these people at HPI, healthcare performance improvement. I said, well, what do I know about healthcare? How could I help in, in that area? And she said, well, we're working with this company, HPI, uh, founded by two nuclear power engineers, and they're, they're talking about all these principles from nuclear power and aviation, and they sort of talk like you talk. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you know how you engineers and pilots are always talking about attention to detail and how you communicate, say, Roger all the time and, um, you know, a checklist and briefing and debriefing. I said, yeah, those are all sound principles and 
you know, they really work. And next thing you know, I talked to Craig and Carrie, and Carrie was the partner here working on um, your engagement when you started off with us back in 2008. And so that next thing you know, here I am 11 years later, and I'm one of the partners now in our transformational services uh, division at Press Ganey. Um, HPI, again, part of the Press Ganey family. Um, at HPI, we focus mostly on the safety and reliability of care, but it's really about the overall experience. And that's our focus at, at, at Press Ganey. I'm joined by Christy Swank, one of our um, regional directors. Uh, well, we have a different term now I should probably be using. Right, because we really are uh, trying to help organizations with the overall transformation of care. The patient experience is really um, what we're interested in that starts with keeping patients safe, but it's, it's really more than that. It's reducing suffering um, in healthcare, the avoidable, preventable suffering that comes from mistakes or errors or gaps in care, but also the inherent suffering that comes from being a patient and the maybe diagnosis that can uh, not be the best thing that you would have wanted or some of the um, inherent suffering that comes along with uh, the treatment. And some people don't like that word suffering. That almost sounds soft or offensive because you don't get in the business to, you know, create suffering for patients. But if you look at the Latin for patient, pati uh, is one who suffers. And I, I think if anybody's been a patient ever, you don't want to be a patient because it means you're sick and it means you're having to be treated for something that can cause a lot of anxiety. So you see in the slide there a little bit more about us at, at HPI and, and what we're doing and who we're working with. and. And again, it is an honor to be part of a larger Press Ganey family now that is trying to reduce suffering and improve the overall patient experience. When we talk about safety and reliability, uh, I like to show this slide to really create a mindset that we're really trying to build this foundation of preventing failure. And um, that's at, at its heart what high reliability is about, trying to develop performance as intended consistently over time now, we always start with a safety first focus, and, and it's what you'll see in these other industries as we talk this morning. Um, when I was in the Navy for those 21 years, I never once heard the term high reliability or high reliability organization. I just knew we were really focused on safety and that safe systems are good systems, and that leads to payoffs and everything else we do. And when you focus on safety first, it tends to grab people at their heart and soul a little bit more because we all want safety for ourselves, our family, our loved ones, our patients that we serve. And so that creates that foundation that we then start applying to our efforts in clinical quality and the experience of care, even around efficiencies and things that lead to better financial uh, performance. And so it's never that we put like safety or these other things uh, that we have to focus on. Um, we say it's not the tyranny of the or, it's the genius of the and. It's safety and quality, safety and um, the, the experience of care, safety and our, you know, financial efforts and things to be efficient and effective. Um, and certainly we know that everything is interconnected. We have a lot of data available to us now um, through uh, hearing from the patients, hearing from our caregivers, and we see all these interconnections between safety, quality, um, the experience, the engagement of our caregivers. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the specific data, but we have that available to you, and, uh, you know, uh, you have access to that data as well, and people like Christy can always help, you know, walk you through those connections. Um, I like to think of it this way, that if I feel, uh, as a member of your organization, that my safety is important, that you care about keeping me safe, and we can't keep our patients safe if we don't keep our people safe, our caregivers, and everybody in the organization is a caregiver, either a direct caregiver or indirect caregiver, I would say. And so if I know that my safety is important and that the mission of the organization is focused on the safe, high-quality, patient-centered care that we want to provide, that naturally makes me more engaged in the work. And if I'm engaged in the work, now I feel more bonded to the organization. I'm going to go that extra mile. I'm going to open up some discretionary space to maybe be more comfortable in speaking up or filling out one of your online event reporting or error uh, you know, reporting uh, 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 reports, okay? Um, that's going to help us identify system problems that are leading to the errors or the gaps in care where we're missing the mark on uh, meeting one of our uh, patients' expectations. That feeds, you know, the safety, the overall experience. Then it becomes this sort of dynamo almost. Uh, we, we call it part of a virtuous cycle, if you will. Because safety feeding engagement, engagement feeding safety starts to create that space for change. It starts to then improve quality. It improves the overall experience. Again, it even improves um, efficiencies 
that um, lead to everything getting better. It's like the tide that floats all boats. Now, when you look at this image here, I want to point out the title at the top. We call it the virtuous cycle because everything starts to improve when we start to think of things in terms of safety, feeding engagement, engagement, feeding safety. But it doesn't work in reverse. In fact, in reverse, it becomes more of a vicious cycle. You know what a vicious cycle is, right? Always downward spiraling. Because if we come in and say we want to cut costs, increase our margin, squeeze, you know, the efficiency of our people, how are they going to respond? Maybe not as, as well as we think, you know, and hammering our fists on the table and focusing on, you know, finances, it's absolutely a role of leaders to make sure that we're being good stewards of our resources and, you know, financially vital. But if that's the message coming to the front line is the first thing in our list, you're going to find yourself in a downward spiral. Now, what I'm recommending is that we, in our journey to reliability, always think of safety and engagement then being the drivers of everything else that we do. And now we see ourselves in a virtuous uphill cycle. Well, there are five key commitments when we you know, really think about developing or um, and ensuring this overall exceptional experience for our patients and their families. And you see it's all built on this foundation of reliability. And when we're going to get into the discussion of, of what, what is the science of reliability and this idea of improving, you know, human performance within the system. But there are other elements as well. Number one, we do have to put safety first, and that means clarifying zero as our goal. Zero events of preventable harm should always be the goal of a high reliability organization. And some people will argue that almost sometimes and say, well, is that actually a realistic goal? What do you all think? Is, is zero uh, acceptable or the right goal in terms of preventable patient harm? Yeah, it's the only goal. Does anybody want to fly in Delta next year if their goal is to crash a couple planes and kill a few hundred people? That almost sounds ridiculous. And yet even when I joined uh, the industry back in 2008, I still heard some of the comments, well, we're not apples to apples, patients are sick, sometimes bad things are going to happen at the complex business. So that's the first thing we got to throw out of our vernacular, the cost of doing business, meaning patient harm, okay? Uh, there certainly are complications, and if we treat those things accordingly and, you know, we're doing all we can, then that would not be what I would call a preventable event necessarily. The second thing over there is we got to make sure we're always trying to continuously improve, be the best at getting better always looking for those breakdowns in our processes and things that are irritants to our people, and, and not just that they're not efficient, but maybe they're not as effective or as well-designed as they could be. Uh, I always like to go to the quote from Muhammad Ali when he talks about you know, overcoming the challenges that he faced throughout his life. And he would say, well, the challenges I face aren't really based upon the steepness of the mountain I have to climb. It's really that pebble in my shoe while I'm, while I'm scaling that mountain. And when we think about our people doing the work at the front line, our nurses, physicians, uh, clinical and non-clinical folks, they've got a lot of pebbles in their shoes. Probably sometimes they have gravel. You know, all these problems that get in their way of doing their jobs and providing, you know, a great experience, keeping patients safe. And, you know, they're having to go 12 different, 20 different directions and overcome some of the complexity. And it should be our job as healthcare leaders to always be trying to find and fix those process problems that are getting in their way. We got to make sure that we're again uh, putting the patient at the center, all about the patient, what's best for the patient, what's safest for the patient. Um, looking at some of the you know best practices to ensure we're meeting those expectations, and then, like I said, engaging our people. And it's not about either patient satisfaction or employee satisfaction. It's about their engagement, um, you know, in the work, the, the experience that they uh, see as part of the organization or the part of the services that are being provided. So with that said, there's a little bit of foundation. I want to talk about this topic of high reliability and provide some examples and thoughts from some of these industries you see here that are usually held up as the usual suspects and, and very uh, have some typical traits in high reliability organizations. And um, I want to give you a little bit of a, of a history lesson, if you will. And um, the reliability theorists are numerous. There's a lot of people that have been doing uh, a lot of studies and research and publication over the years, really dating back to the early to mid 80s, you see some of the scientists on the left. Everybody's probably familiar with Carl Wake and Kathleen Sutcliffe. Um, they talked about the five principles of high reliability. I'll touch upon a few of those in a moment. Uh, you got Dr. Alberti from France and Carlene Roberts, uh, 
Carolyn Nybeeser will talk about some of these as well. Wedstrom and Hudson coming from Shell Oil. Bert Schlagmolen, I won't really talk about him or Charles Perot too much, but there's all these folks that, again, were the researchers, the PhDs, and wrote a lot of papers. And a lot of those are available to you, and um, we can send those out. You have the craftsmen. These are people that actually did it in the field, and then a lot of them wrote about it. Admiral Rickover from the Nuclear Submarine Force, Admiral Mercer from Carrier Aviation. Chung Chu is an MIT professor, um, actually uh, founded a company called uh, Failure Performance International, worked a lot of manufacturing around the world. Um, our founding partners worked with uh, Dr. Chu um, in the 80s and 90s and really stood up a lot of the human performance principles in the nuclear power industry still in use. And then Sidney Decker um, from Ohio State, um, human um, error expert, talks a lot about fair and just culture in his writings and books. You've got the field engineers. These are a lot of the folks who have helped organizations bring the principles to reality. We put ourselves there at HPI on that, the folks at Safe and Reliable, which is um, uh, working with IHI and the National Patient Safety Foundation. And then you have the Joint Commission. There's others as well. Uh, on that list, and then some of the integrators starting to help, you know, make it a reality in, in healthcare, like Baldridge, and a lot of folks have gone on a Baldridge journey and have seen some of those HRO principles that are integrated. HRQ is, is more uh, doing the measurements to the patient safety um, surveys and other devices. Uh, Christine Sammer is an author and researcher, uh, worked a lot of, uh, out at Adventist, and we're going to see in a moment a paper that she's written that starts to codify some of the HRO principles around leadership and teamwork and being a learning organization. Um, and that starts to create some of the connections as well. A lot of this uh, transition, um, when you uh, look at some of the history, starts in the 1980s. And really prior to that, it was a focus on a lot more just human error and human performance. Jens Rasmussen is the one who really at first identified how humans perform and how we experience, I like to use the term experience human error. You may recall if you've gone through your uh, Power of One safety training that our brains are fabulous devices, but what our brains want to do more than anything else is minimize mental effort, meaning we want to make things simpler. And so we've done something a lot in a very frequent, familiar environment. We do that in what's called skill-based performance. It's like being an autopilot. If you've ever driven to work and gotten your parking spot and have no idea how you got there, welcome to skill-based performance. You know, and then you have rule-based performance where you have to think and we recall stored knowledge in the form of rules. And then if we go to find that rule, it's not there. We're in what's called knowledge-based performance. So Rasmussen was from the University of Denmark, and then a lot of his ideas were uh, grabbed onto by Dr. Jim Reason, who you know came up with the Swiss cheese model. He referred to it as a generic error modeling system to really talk more about how you overcome some of these tendencies of the human brain to reduce human error and just start to close some of those holes in the Swiss cheese model. But then the thinking started to evolve and really go more towards this idea of, of systems thinking with a focus on safety culture. There's Westerman and Hudson from Shell Oil. They came up with this program called the Hearts and Minds program, literally getting to people's hearts by talking about the data, the potential for harm, minds, some of the you know, um, uh, uh, specific um, evidence-based practices. You could actually Google the Shell Oil Hearts and Minds program and read a lot about what they did. Um, Vernon Bradley was from DuPont. Uh, if you look at the history of DuPont and places like Alcoa, big focus on safety, um, recognizing that safety is, a, is, again, a good enabler, a good driver of human performance. And then it was Carlene Roberts and her colleagues, Gene Rockland and Todd Laporte out at um, Berkeley in San Francisco that in 1985 went out and visited USS Carl Vinson at sea, and they published a paper and said, hey, these people are doing things a little differently out here. And, you know, they had this extremely complex environment, you know, pilots landing day and night in pitching decks, you know, uh, weather conditions, live ordnance, you know, um, jets landing every 45 seconds and taking off in conditions good and bad. The average age in the flight deck, about 20 years old, and the young sailors that are moving airplanes around, refueling them, reloading them with high explosive ordnance. You know, how do they do this? and not seem to have more than what we would expect with, to be their fair share of accidents and events. And so that started opening up, you know, a little bit more focus on these high reliability organizations. That's the people within the system. The verb is actually high reliability organizing and the things that they're doing to create that kind of environment. It started to transition over to this idea of being mindful and the five principles that Wyke and Sutcliffe 
put down on paper in their great book, Managing the Unexpected, were about developing organizational mindfulness. And I just love that term, mindfulness, because I like to think of it as the opposite. What's the opposite of mindfulness? Yeah, mindlessness. And I don't know about you, but I don't want mindless people working on my airplane, the flight deck of a carrier, or loading weapons, or, you know, working in a nuclear power facility, flying my family to Cleveland. And I don't want mindless people taking care of me or my family in a healthcare environment. I want mindful people looking out for what can go wrong, talking about it, learning from their mistakes that we're all going to make from time to time, making really clear the expectations, reinforcing. And that's what Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe started to see. It was actually Carl Weick, um, again, some of the family tree, was a student of Carlene Roberts out at Berkeley. So it's called the Berkeley School or the Berkeley Group. And so he went to Michigan, teamed up with Kathleen Sutcliffe, and they are the ones that wrote the book, Managing the Unexpected with those five principles. And we'll talk a little bit about those. And now it's come up to more looking at resilience engineering and how do we make our systems more resilient. You know, resiliency is that ability to bend but not break. You know, uh, we, if you're uh, in, at all to engineering or materials management, you know, you've got brittle failure in our materials where they just sort of snap. It's like the oak tree that suddenly snaps in high wind conditions. But an oak tree is really strong, isn't it? It's really stalwart to, uh, in the wind. And so we want the resilience of an oak tree to defend our system against sort of the expected kind of problems. And we do that through automation and good process design, standardization in our work activities. But one of those things fail like a piece of technology fails or a process breaks down, you know, um, we want to have the resiliency of the palm tree. Because a palm tree in high wind conditions bends to almost parallel, and then what does it do after the wind subsides? It bounces back. It pops back up. It's more malleable in terms of how we think of materials that can bend but not break. And that kind of resiliency is built through people that can recognize when a system isn't working as intended. They can think together as a team and see, hey, something's not quite right, or maybe somebody's not sticking with a policy or procedure and has that comfort level in speaking up, that we learn from some of our organizational failures and we share that learning uh, to not have to repeat events or have worse events next time. So there's that kind of resilience. And that's the kind of stuff that the folks are talking about up here. Uh, Doctors uh, Cook and Woods from the University of Chicago, they started to uh, get, again, develop systems thinking for the blunt end, sharp end model. Um, that talks about people doing the work at the sharp end, thousands of activities every day that they perform. Those actions, the outcomes are all based upon their behaviors. Low risk behaviors means fewer errors. So we all want to adopt and stick with low risk behaviors, especially in high risk situations. You would refer to those as tools to prevent human error, okay? But the outcomes and our behaviors aren't just us alone. They're highly influenced by what Cook and Woods call the blunt end. That's where the system problems all are lying. And those systems things influence people doing the work. Influencers like our structure, the job design training influences people, the, the resources we provide, staffing levels, right? Those all act as influencers to the people at the sharp end. And then you've got the influencer of, the, of our process, the policy, the technology. And, and we find the biggest system level influencer is back to culture. So this whole thing sort of comes full circle when you look at, at some of this uh, history um, that we see in the chart. I don't have time to go into everybody on the chart. I thought I'd talk about a few of them. Wyke and Sutcliffe, um, we're going to, you know, we're talking about that more in our high reliability refresher series. But there are a couple of things on here I want to point out um, that the first three principles are all about trying to anticipate failure before it occurs. How do leaders try to look at little things as big things waiting to happen? How are we very sensitive to operations, understanding the workload, resource mismatches that are always out there? Leaders needing to be really keenly aware of where the complex work is going on, where the infrequently performed work is happening, where are new people engaged in, in high risk or complex activity. Those are all situations that were more at risk of errors or if errors occur that it can become worse than it has to be. And so we're always trying to manage that as HRO leaders. I remember my commanding officers, leaders in the Navy, always making sure that our newest pilots weren't in the most high risk situations, that they had good oversight, wingmen, is a term you may be familiar with when we were starting out and flying those missions, you know, in combat. Um, we always had new people, but we made sure we kept a close eye on them as they build that level of experience. And you would see that hopefully in how you um, keep oversight of your residents and new people, uh, precept the new nurses and other clinical and non-clinical staff. Um, 
The commitment to resilience we already talked about, but a couple of thoughts on there that we've got to be able to absorb um, high demands. We're always going to have fluctuating census and sometimes call-outs of staff members and uh, unusual situations. And in an HRO, we have to be able to absorb that and be flexible and be able to deal with it. We're going to sometimes have significant events, and we've got to be able to overcome those and return to service and, and learn and grow um, uh, from uh, events that occasionally occur, share those lessons broadly across the organization. And then the deference to expertise means we're always trying to push decision making to the lowest level possible. People do it the most, not necessarily the most senior in rank or hierarchy. I recall flying back in uh, 1991, I was a new pilot in my first squadron, um, uh, VFA 15, Strike Fighter Squadron, um, on deployment in the Persian Gulf. And it was during Desert Storm, uh, I was on um, USS Roosevelt. I was flying a mission as a fairly new pilot. I had a, a lead, flight lead, um, who was looking out for me. But I lost an engine over southern Iraq, so I had to turn around and come back to the ship. As I was descending um, out of altitude, the plane still had three external fuel tanks, um, so it was, uh, had a lot of drag. Um, some unexpended ordnance was sort of heavy. As I was coming down the glide slope that you come in to land the back of the carrier, we have some landing aids that help us determine we're on the glide slope and on lineup. And uh, suddenly over the radio, the landing signal officer who stands right beside where you land, they're on a, a phone, they're talking to you, said that I was a little low and that I needed power. But I didn't think I needed power. My landing aides told me I was right on the glide slope, but we were taught to defer to their expertise. These landing signal officers were pilots who came off the flight schedule every four days and stood there and watched landing after landing after landing. Um, 18 hours a day, good weather or bad. They got so good, they could see if you were five feet high or low or left or right before you saw it in the, in the cockpit as a pilot. And so we just naturally would respond to them. I added power, and thankfully I did, because they saw me starting to get what's called the verbal effect. As the wind comes over the flight deck and around the island superstructure of an aircraft carrier, it creates almost a sinkhole behind the ship. And, and they saw that that was pretty high that day. I was getting into that effect, knew I was underpowered with one engine, and the engines take a few moments to spool up, and so they, they had me come up on the power. I caught that, um, that settle, as we call it. I still landed a little bit low, but I'm here to talk about it, so I guess it worked out okay. That's sort of a, what a deference to expertise is all about. Those young pilots fly a lot. They come off the flight schedule to stand out there and get very good at what they do. They're not the most senior person in the ship. Captain, the air wing commander, the admiral, they defer to their judgment and expertise on those kind of decisions. Um, and it's just the right way to do things. How would we think about that in a healthcare environment? Let's say we're in surgery. Oh, you said you're a surgeon, right? Let's say at the end of a very complex case and suddenly the scrub tech speaks up and says, hey, we're missing a sponge. Well, do we stop and defer to their expertise? They're the experts that maintain the count. Do we stop and say, hey, we're gonna wait until you say it's safe to go forward? Or do we sometimes respond differently? I would ask you all to consider that and how we, you know, demonstrate that mutual respect and acknowledge the experience of one another uh, and, and put that principle into practice. I mentioned Dr. Elmer Berti, he's a medical doctor, also an um, engineer, uh, a pilot uh, from France, and he's written a number of papers and books that you can go uh, download. He talks about accepting limits on discretionary actions in, in terms of building an HRO, and that means uh, in aviation, hey, when we can fly and when we can't fly based on weather conditions and airplane, you know, minimum equipment list and things like that. Some of those ideas that we want to maybe integrate into healthcare. Hey, when is it okay to do surgery and not okay to do surgery? When is it okay for a patient to get certain types of treatments or medication? When is it not okay? So now we're starting to think about, you know, standardization and, and some of those limits on what goes and what doesn't go. The abandoning autonomy is about thinking of ourselves more as a part of, a, of an ecosystem, if you will, uh, part of the bigger picture or the example when we drive. When I drive down the road, especially on a two-lane divided highway, I have to abandon some of my own autonomy, don't I? Because it'd be great just to hog both lanes and go back and forth and you know do whatever I want, but that may not be too good for the overall you know ecosystem of uh, the, the safety of our of our driving. And in the same vein, you know we want to think about how that applies to what we do um, in the healthcare environment. And transitioning from a, a craftsman to a equivalent actor, that HROs re recognizes ex expertise is really really good. But what's also good is having a system that doesn't have to rely on purely the expertise of, of one person, I meaning the, the, the art of the craftsman, okay? 
And so when you fly, if your captain suddenly falls ill or has to be rescheduled and goes out of the cockpit, they bring another captain in, you're probably okay with that, pretty confident that that new captain is still trained to the standards and going to do business as it needs to be done safely and effectively. Um, in healthcare, we see some of this transition in a lot of the different professions. You know, you probably aren't as concerned about your anesthesiologist rotating out, but maybe you'd feel different about suddenly having a different surgeon there at the helm. And we certainly want that art and science and expertise of, uh, of a surgeon, but we also want to see, hey, how do we make sure that we always are sticking to best practices and, uh, and standardization in terms of a lot of the work? Um, we see it happening with how you now are doing a lot of your clinical bundles to reduce infections around central line insertions and VAT prevention. I mean, these are some of the things now that are starting to become so standardized that it doesn't matter who does it. We're going to do it to that high standard based upon the evidence. Roberts and Libuser, um, Carlene Roberts is the one I mentioned from the Berkeley School, uh, talks a lot about auditing. HROs are not going to be afraid to go out and inspect, okay? And we shouldn't just reserve our inspections for the external folks when the Joint Commission, or I'm not sure if you're DNV these days, and we prepare for that, and then what do we do when they leave, you know? We want to always be thinking about internal auditing and checking our, on ourselves and looking for those degradations in quality. Um, we want to make sure we have a high perception of risk in the organization, always talking about harm and the potential for harm. I remember seeing a poster in my early days of flying. It was in one of our work centers when I was in flight school, and it showed the hand of a sailor except the ring finger had been completely degloved, and they had the skin and tissue sitting right beside the hand with the, his ring sitting there. It was pretty gruesome, if you can imagine seeing this poster. Um, and the quote underneath said, honey, I told you I'd never take off my ring. And it was a poster put out by the Naval Safety Center as a way to try to make people aware of the risk of doing maintenance or flying with your ring on, which is why I always took my ring off when I was flying put it right in my flight suit pocket next to my heart. You can tell my wife I said that. Yeah. <laughs> but yet I flew with a lot of people, and I occasionally saw maintainers that wore their rings when they were doing that kind of work. So why do you think they were wearing their rings, doing maintenance, or maybe flying a plane where you can get caught in a rivet or a fastener if you eject, maybe pull your finger right off? Why would people do that? I say because they probably didn't see that poster. Because once you see that poster and you become aware of the risk, it changes you. It changes your behavior. It changes your understanding, your perception of risk. And I'm not saying ever show images of patient harm, but I hope you're getting more comfortable talking about potential for patient harm, sharing some of the lessons learned, sharing a great catch is sharing one step away from having been a possible event. Some of the current command and control functions, HRO leaders are big on situational awareness. And that's why in our daily safety huddles and discussions, we want to be aware and sharing awareness of where we're at risk. What happened yesterday that could put us at risk and what can we learn from it? What's going on today that's different? You know, what are some high-risk activities? Who are our new people? Make sure we're not putting our highest-risk patient with our newest uh, person or, or overburdening them. There's the standardization again. Big on authority gradients. Authority gradients are what stifle people from speaking up, and so we really have to be always watching out for that. We're going to talk more about that. Here's Carlene Roberts again, talking about always aggressively seeking what you don't know, okay? Um, making sure that uh, we're always designing incentives uh, to promote this idea of safety, reliability, and always communicating the big picture. Rasmussen, we heard about him. Uh, he talked about this dynamic systems model. This is really interesting, because what he does is he puts the organization at the center. So here we are at Children's National at the center and the dot. We've got all these pressures on us. We've got the economic failure boundary. We know what happens when we cross that, right? We're not going to be uh, financially viable to keep the doors open, so nature wants to stay away from that boundary. We've got the unacceptable workload boundary in the bottom. We cross that. We start to burn out our people. They start to speak with their feet. Everybody else has to pick up the load. That just becomes a, a part of a vicious cycle. And then over to the left, we've got that acceptable performance boundary we call our safety boundary. We cross that, and now we start to have safety events, and that can become... Uh, in some cases, catastrophic. An HRO always has a margin there that they want to make sure that they don't cross, okay? It's not like we cross the boundary and then decide, oh, well, we've got off the cliff, let's take a step back. We lost a couple of patients, we injured some staff. No, we want to have that margin built in, and we want to know where we are, and we've crossed the margin. 
all right? And, and that comes through different indications. In HRO world, you have a lot of gauges and dials and a nuclear power facility. It'll tell you how close you're getting to the, you know, plant, um, you know, having an overheating condition or a possible meltdown. In aviation, we've got our gauges and dials that tells us where we are relative to the envelope of the airplane. But in healthcare, you don't always have a visible indication where that margin is. That's why you have to put things in place like your huddles and like out there rounding and, and looking at your metrics and data to get a feel for where we are. And here's the biggest thing I want you to take away from this, this model is don't feel because you crossed the margin and nothing bad happened that we can now expand the margin or, or, or actually compress it and maybe we'll just go a little farther. And that's what we tend to do. We say, oh, we did a great job today with a little less uh, staff or we made it happen in this high census condition or we, we, we did okay with fewer resources. I think this is an okay place now to operate because we keep doing that and then one day we find ourselves going over the cliff and that leads to problems, okay? This is, he calls it the dynamic system model because these boundaries are always moving based upon external conditions. Our circle is always moving around inside of it because of what we're dealing with each and every day. So we have to really uh, mind the store there. So I've talked a lot about a lot of, a lot of descriptive theories and um, there's Christine Samerer's article. Uh, Dr. Decker, I mentioned earlier from Ohio State, um, and I have both of them here because there's not a lot of people who have taken these principles and really turned them into practices. Because the principles are great, the theory is great, but sometimes we just want to say, hey, tell me what you want me to do. And, you know, these are both a couple of folks that have uh, attempted to do that pretty nicely, but not a lot of people have told us, you know, um, really how to do high reliability organizing. We like to think of this as a key part of that, these drivers, if you will. Because there on the left, I've shown you some of the different theory we've talked about. At the top, we can see from Admiral Mercer, he talked about flattening hierarchies, you know, making it easy for people to speak up. He talked a lot about demonstrating respect and how you do that between um, different professionals. There's some of the Wyke and Sut Sutcliffe, Elmer Berti, Wedstrom and Hutzel. I like what they say about safety being equal to production. In fact, what I say is we need, we need to make sure we're always putting protection over production. All right, when we start putting production over protection, that can lead to problems. There are some other ones we discussed. Now, when we start to think of the drivers of that, look to the right side of the chart, okay? Because to Admiral Mercer's point, start to do some things to demonstrate mutual respect to one another. Maybe that's smiling, maintaining eye contact, the tones, and a lot of organizations that are having clear tones in addition to their tools to prevent human error. Things we do to think as teams and operate in a collegial environment. Things we do to reduce attentional errors, like that STAR technique, or enhance and promote critical thinking by having a questioning attitude, stopping when we're unsure, or going and getting the expert. These are all examples of what we call universal skills. It's not like the technical skills you've all been trained on as clinical and non-clinical experts in your fields. In healthcare, you spend a lot of time on that, but we don't sometimes sp uh, spend a lot of time on learning the non-technical skills on how to communicate, how to speak up, how to assert ourselves, work well as a team. And we need to invest some time and energy in, in knowing how to do that. And then you have the things that are more leader skills for how we enhance and ensure a just culture. Don't punish unintentional human error. At the same time, we've got to make sure that, we, that there are fair consequences when people choose to act recklessly. How do we make our huddles work effectively and, and really, you know, make sure we're getting all those principles that I discussed in terms of where the problems are and how we're learning from events and having openness and reporting. Of course, the measurements and controls loop and how we learn uh, through our cause analysis programs, all that is part of HR leadership skills. And when you see organizations that, that have done a good job of going from theory to practice, it looks something like this. This comes from the nuclear power industry. Nine specific areas that they say are important, you know, to um, ensure and sustain a robust, you know, safety and reliability culture. Leadership actions, how we identify problems, personal accountability for our behaviors, always trying to fix the processes and continuously learn, making sure we have an environment for speaking up and sharing information, having good communications, respectful work environments, and always encouraging a, a questioning attitude. And again, we can send these slides out so you can read more about you know, these things uh, for folks to do. What I thought I would do is just give you a couple of examples of them from more from my background. First thing I wanna show you is what it looks like to come into land in an aircraft carrier seat. And so this is a video of a plane in a descending left-hand turn, uh, getting ready to snag one of uh, the wires.
know, the ship has to have 25 knots of wind on the flight deck, which is why it has such a big wake. It's a calm day. This looks like it's probably the Persian Gulf without a lot of waves. And there's the landing aid I saw, the, I told you about the left, the green datums. You're trying to keep a, a yellow meatball right in the middle. And there you go. Full power when you land in case you miss the wires so you can take off and do it again. That was actually a pretty good landing, about a 150 knot uh, approach. Um, every landing that you make on a carrier is graded. All of my 700 plus carrier landings on LSO, who I told you about, came back and give me a grade, how I did, a little high, low, left or right. And that was part of that preoccupation with failure. Because even though you thought you had a pretty good landing, which would go on a board in our ready room, the measurements that we had were, they were very public, like your public reported data, or maybe your, your, your stuff that's out there for all to see. And, an, and a good landing was a green, we call it the greeny board, you want to have green, that's like a 4.0. But if you're a little low, left or right of the center line, you may get a B, and nobody likes to get a B, do they? You know, we're all like hard chargers. But the preoccupation with failure says, hey, you're a little low, a little left or right, we need you to fix that. Get back to the glide slope, get back to center line the next time. And why are we trying to do that? Why do you get a B even if you're just a little high or low left or right? Well, I'll show you this next video from a, a camera mounted in the flight deck looking up the glide slope as the plane comes into land. I think you'll understand why we're so hypercritical. Here the plane comes into land. Looks off to me. Got a little off center line there, big correction, and we can see. Thankfully, it still caught the, uh, the wire that you used to grab with your tail hook to keep it from going into those planes, but it did collapse the landing gear, broke the wing, caused other aircraft damage um, that would uh, uh, result in the equivalent of a root cause analysis for that you know, serious event. So we're trying to keep that kind of bad thing by ha from happening by focusing on the little things, okay? And so why we want you to so focus on near misses and reporting. Look at your little events as a way to keep the big events from one day happen and try to have that happen in an open collegial environment where people aren't afraid of reporting and talking about things. That's a big challenge because people are naturally hesitant to report and errors and events due to the fear, burden, or you know, never hearing back you know, what happened due to the reports. But an HRO is always trying to learn from the little things before they become the big things later on. This um, idea of building leadership awareness, sensitivity operations, I huddled my entire career. Huddled at every level. Huddled as a young junior officer in the maintenance department, later as a squadron operations officer, as an air wing operations officer, eventually as an uh, uh, air operations officer for a fleet battle group commander, Admiral Ray Spicer, shown here. And we would huddle every day with the Admiral, and we would talk about what happened yesterday and what's going on today. And, and it hopefully looks and sounds a lot like, you know, your leadership huddles that, that I know you're having. One of the takeaways here was the Admiral was there every day. It was his meeting. And he expected you to be there and be ready to report, you know, having got up to speed on what's going on in your environment, have good situational awareness, share that with the rest of the leadership team, gave him an opportunity to assign resources, set priorities, give guidance. It just became part of our, our rhythm. We called it our battle rhythm. And so we want to think of our huddles as sacrosanct, whether it be a unit huddle, a leadership huddle, having that senior leader at the table. If the Admiral wasn't there one day, we would all be shocked. Hey, what's going on? And if it happened over a period of time, we probably would have taken messages from that. I guess this isn't important anymore. And so the Admiral knew that and, and made it part of, of his day every day um, to invoke how important it is that we're all aware and sensitive to operations. Another thing we did to build daily awareness of operations is getting out there to where the work was being done. And this idea of rounding on the flight deck, I would call it, or, or the FOD walk down. FOD stands for foreign object debris, little nuts or bolts something as small as a paper clip getting sucked into an engine intake that starts to tear apart the turbines and can lead to a fire or an explosion uh, and a lot of problems. And so every day we would line up three times a day, hundreds of the sailors with leaders out there with them, influencing their behaviors, making sure we're keeping our heads down, shoulder to shoulder, looking for these small bits of, uh, of hard material, um, collecting them so we can study the trends and what we're seeing. And what I always like about this concept is I retired over 10 years ago, but I don't have to think twice wondering if they're still out there rounding in the flight deck. I just know it happens three times a day, every day on our ships at sea. I don't have to think twice about it because they've built that into the structure and leaders are out there doing it as well with the front line. Again, keeping an eye and making sure that they're uh, doing it the right way. Because I don't know about you, again, remember I said the average age in the flight deck, 19 to 20 year old. Anybody have a 19 to 20 year old? 
if, you, if I just let my 19 to 22 year olds do this, they'd probably be on their cell phones or joking with their neighbor and they'd miss that one important thing. So think about the structures we have in place. HROs love structure. I had an old commanding officer, he said, Steve, there's a fine line between micromanagement and thorough oversight. I love that quote. So I think what he was saying is we've got to make sure we're thorough in how we're doing things and do things together. And I hope that doesn't feel like it's micromanaging, but it is intended to ensure we're doing things tightly. This idea of flattening hierarchies, making it easier for people to speak up and to identify problems, ask questions. Sometimes it's difficult due to power distance, which is this effect where people perceive that they're somewhere in the pecking order. Uh, Gert Hofstede defined it as the extent to which the less powerful expect and accept that power is distributed unequally, and it leads to a lot of strong gradients. He measured it around the world, found in certain countries like Singapore, Indonesia, certain Latin American countries. They grew up in a very high power distance culture, where if you're in one end of the cultural, social, economic, gender spectrum, you don't challenge or speak up to somebody in a position of power. If you want to read more about it, I recommend Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Chapter 7 will tell you all you need to know about power distance. He described the case of Korean Airlines Flight 801. It was flying in 1997, August of that year, from South Korea to the island of Guam. Very long flight. The captain had been rerouted and rescheduled. It was a long flight. He was tired and fatigued. He was an award-winning 747 pilot with a lot of flight time, but even the best of the best sometimes are having a bad day. Okay? Plus, they had grown up in this Korean culture, which was very deferential to age and seniority and experience. Now, they were flying to the island of Guam, but there was a minor technical failure in that the primary landing aid at the runway was out of service. They were actually flying on a beacon on Nimitz Hill, and then once they hit that, they were supposed to dead reckon. Uh, once they overflew the beacon, then dead reckon to the airfield. But the captain got confused. There was a low cloud layer. They couldn't see the runway. So all these were sort of the scene setters in our Swiss cheese model, but the biggest problem was that high power distance in the cockpit, that the captains were gods. They didn't accept people speaking up, and as a co-pilot, you certainly didn't question the captain's authority at Korean Airlines. There was a story about a captain slapping a co-pilot that had once spoken up to point out an error or mistake. Now tell me, is anybody ever going to speak up again in an organization if they're being slapped? And while we may not have physical slapping in our organization, do we ever hear about verbal slapping? I hear about it all the time. How about body language slapping? You know what body language slapping is? Like the eye rolling, hip thrusting. You know, some of these things that don't demonstrate that considerable mutual respect that we need to have to encourage people to speak up. Because the co-pilots knew that they were off course. They knew something was amiss. But they were staying firmly within those cultural boundaries and, and didn't speak up until it was too late when they broke out of the clouds, saw the hill there that they were um, uh, about to hit. Uh-oh, what happened here? And so um, they impacted Nimitz Hill, crashed, and killed um, everybody aboard, 228 folks, primarily due to this power distance effect. And this gets back to that, that um, one principle about um, being reluctant to simplify interpretations. What we want to do is we want to always encourage a diversity of thought and opinion, people speaking up, being very comfortable um, and asking questions to overcome those hierarchies. So that's the Swiss cheese model is all about trying to close those holes, whether a hole be somebody not speaking up or a hole somebody not paying attention, a hole being somebody not knowing or having the competencies. It's our job as leaders to make sure they have those competencies. Reduce the human error make our systems more resilient along the way to contain and detect and bounce back from those problems when they occur. Another flying story, back in 1985, I was an instructor pilot uh, flying in the F-18 training squadron off the coast of Jacksonville. And it always reminds me of Swiss cheese model because one of the things we had to do as pilots, as instructors, we was, uh, had to always go through what would happen if we got into a spin, our departure spin procedures. We would recite them in our flight briefings. And I've got over 3,000 flight hours. I've probably recited that departure spin checklist almost 3,000 times. But I only got in one spin off the coast of Jacksonville in 1985 when I was in the back seat of a student's jet. And the students, towards the end of their syllabus, would go out and practice that dog fighting part of their training, where you're trying to get behind a jet to simulate using your weapons. And as my student pulled over the top of one maneuver, he didn't pull hard enough. We got too slow. We flipped over and went into a flat spin. And you probably know the flat spin from the great movie Top Gun right, Goose and Mavs spinning out to sea. Probably the only realistic part of that movie is when they're spinning, very disorienting. 
type of environment, eyes out, G-forces, and there we were spinning. We went from 20,000 feet to 10,000 feet in probably 30 seconds. And the procedure says at 10,000 feet eject, we used to joke, give the jet back to taxpayers, <laughs> you know. But having had all that training and reciting the, the departure spend procedure, and I could tell the student didn't quite know what to do, only having 80 flight hours, I shouted, let me see your hands so we weren't fighting for the control stick. I took over and put in the anti-spin logic, and we popped out right before 10,000 feet, thank goodness, decided to come back and call it a day. Now, that success, that that wasn't due to me, and I'm not, I'm not saying that to brag on my performance. I mean, I was scared out of my wits, you know. But I went right to the training and having recited those procedures so many times, and that was, again, the only time I had to use it. So you tell me, was it worth it to have recited and gone through those procedures so many times in our flight briefings when I only needed it one time my whole career? Yeah, you better believe it was worth it. It was worth it to me, my family, and all you taxpayers. Those jets are expensive. And here's how it relates to Swiss cheese. And I hope you take this lesson, if nothing else, one of the most important lessons. Is it worth it to our patients if you as a nurse, if you're a nurse, check the name and date of birth every time you're going to a patient's room before you're given a medication, doing a therapy or a procedure, every time, even though you've been in that patient's room 10 times a day, or you've taken care of that patient for three days in a row. Is it worth it if it stops that one wrong medication error over the course of a career? How about if you're a physician and you're in surgery? And I know your timeouts can become sort of rote, but to do a good engaging discussion and do it every time, when it only catches one time out of an entire career or 10,000 opportunities, you're about to do the wrong surgery or on the wrong side or with the wrong patient, is it worth it to have done it all those times? I tell you what, it's worth it if it's my daughter who actually goes to Johns Hopkins for surgeries on a venous malformation or left leg. She's had 30 surgeries over the years, and it's worth it to me, and I venture to say it's worth it to all your patients. That's the nature of Swiss cheese is standardization, looking for the holes, and sticking to what we know is right. So all those layers become more like cheddar rather than Swiss. Cheddar's better, I guess we would say. Deference to expertise, I mentioned this, pushing decision-making. They're the young LSOs I mentioned, giving the feedback to a pilot. And we were always big on letting the young sailors have permission to speak up, shut down the flight deck if they noticed a problem, circle on the planes overhead while we figured out that problem and recognizing and rewarding them for having the courage to speak up. That's just what we do in an HRO kind of mindset. I thought I'd play this last video before I close up to bring some of these ideas maybe into better focus. We're all familiar with the miracle landing on the Hudson. You know, it was just the 10th year anniversary, and maybe some of you saw the movie. Somehow they took a three-minute event and turned it into an hour-and-a-half feature film. <laughs> Let's watch this unfold in three minutes and, and codify some of these lessons and these things we've been talking about. Check this 1549-700, climbing 5,000. Check this 1549-800, departure to contact, climb maintain 15,000. Maintain 15,000, check this 1549. Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 15.39, hit first, through cross through us, and both hits to returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tire, stop your departure, he's got emergency returning. It's 15.29, he, uh, bird strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus 15.29, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Act is 1529. We can get it to you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. Act is 1529. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia departure guy, emergency inbound. Hey, go ahead. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1. That's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. He can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry. Say again, Cactus. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5, 4718, turn left thing 210. 210, uh, 
I like how this image morphs into the actual uh, image we're all familiar with we see here. And the most important takeaway I want to leave you with today is note the people in first class are on the raft. <laughs> <laughs> the people in coach are on the icy cold wings. Get that upgrade, Kathy, whenever you can. Very important. That's not the real lesson. Um, I'll close with a couple important lessons from our discussion. You may have heard the air traffic controller giving Sully all that information, right? Probably stuff you didn't really need about going to Tito Barrow, back to LaGuardia, there's a lot going on in the cockpit. But did you ever once hear Sully fire back and say, hey, can you shut up? If I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. I didn't hear that. You see, he is that leader was setting the environment for people to speak up, to ask questions, to share information. I look at that as a lot of that reluctance to simplify and the deference to expertise of the air traffic controller, you know. Wouldn't have been tragic to land that plane in the Hudson, have everybody drown because they couldn't get out. Who's responsible primarily for getting the passengers out of the cabin in an emergency? Flight attendants, and there they are, recognized at the first ever Distinguished Flying Award. One of them was up to her neck in water in the back of the plane. That tells us about everybody has a job to do in our organization. You can be the greatest surgeon, the greatest you know, clinicians in the world. If we don't have a room that's been cleaned uh, well by the folks in environmental services, we're not providing exceptional care. If we don't have folks in dietary making sure we're providing food and nutrition or facilities to keep the lights and power on, it really is everybody in terms of a team effort. I would really boil a lot of HRO thinking down to teamwork, you know, and how we work together. Even Sully says it there. It's all about the crew, which is a, a, a synonymous for team. Um, there's uh, the air traffic controller who got uh, an award. There's the co-pilot. Even Sully, when he's lauded as the hero of this event, I heard him speak down in Norfolk um, a few years ago. He says, hey, it's not about me. He goes, everybody had a part to play. He's very humble about it. Um, you know, how he and the co-pilots throughout his career always briefed what's going on. That's like our huddles, talking about what could happen today and what's different about today and, and debriefing whenever possible, the lessons learned from each and every flight. And, you know, the idea of, you know, working well as a team, everybody speaking up. So just almost in that one three-minute video, we can see all these principles of high reliability. Uh, just to conclude, and I'll stay for questions, I uh, maybe – uh, went a little bit long in terms of having time for Q&A, but I just want to emphasize one of the first things we need to do to build and sustain our HR is always make sure safety is at the core of what we do, but not safety only. Make sure we're open to the idea that harm happens and we're talking about it a lot, that we're measuring it and always trying to get to zero, zero the only acceptable number. Making sure when we think about reliability, yeah, it's the process and the system design, but it's a lot of the people too, helping people to become less error prone and reinforcing those behaviors we got to have clear and concrete, not abstract ideas around, you know, human performance, but very specific things we expect. We call those error prevention tools and techniques as well as tones and how we interact with one another. And then we have to make sure we have good leadership that's always reinforcing, finding and fixing those system problems, you know, that are out there, messaging how important safety is. And it really does take everybody in the organization, from the board all the way to our folks at the front line, uh, making sure we always are engaging our medical staff. So I, I hope uh, I, I gave you something to think about. Again, I'm sorry I went maybe right up to the limit, but I'll turn it back to Rahul, and I'll certainly stick around for Q&A. That was fantastic. I think my lesson learned from that Sully video is just, like, denied and no. I can't wait to use that when I'm driving with my family. Um, do we have questions? I want to make two or three comments, but uh, questions. Otherwise, I'm going to have you come up and talk to Steve. Let me just make a couple comments. Uh, there's a reason Steve is here speaking with us. We've been on a journey, and that journey started in 2008, and we've really come full circle. I'm looking back at David and Kathy. When we rebooted our safety initiative in May of 2018, we were pushing that acceptable safety boundary, and we felt it, but I personally couldn't characterize that, but now we know what we were feeling. Where things didn't feel right, we thought we were pushing the limits, and that's why David and Kathy said, let's reboot our safety program and go back to basics. And that's where he'll be spending the rest of the day with us. We started talking about the Sydney Marie Snyder family. In 2007, when she was cared for here at Children's National, we had 23 serious safety events, 23 other children just like Sydney Marie Snyder. Last year, we've had two to three. We've had a 90% reduction. And that's a great journey that we've been on, and it's very poignant that you come back 10 years later. And you applaud us. That's good. But, but I don't because we want to aim for zero. And, and that's one of your tenants there, and that's what David and Kathy pushes. So we're thrilled about that, but until we get to zero, we've got a lot of work to do. So we'll see you back in 10 years, and hopefully then we'll be at zero. Thank you, folks. Thank you.